this heart open wide from the depths from the heights I will bring a sacrifice with these hands lifted high hear my song hear my cry I will bring a sacrifice I will bring a sacrifice I lay me down I'm not my own I belong to you alone lay me down lay me down whoa much is true, there's no life apart from you, lay me down, lay me down, letting go of my pride, giving up all my rights, take this life and live. It shine, shine, shine. Take this light and let it shine. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Oh, oh, oh. Much is true. There's no life apart from you. Lay me down, lay me down. Whoa, lay me down, lay me down. Lay me down. It will be my joy to say your will, your way. It will be my joy to say Your will, your way It will be my joy to say Your will, your way Always It will be my joy to say Your will, your way it will be my joy to say Your will, your way It will be my joy to say Your will, your way Our way I lay me down, I'm not my own I belong to Lay me down, lay me down Whoa, hand on my heart, this much is true There's no life apart from you Lay me down, lay me down I lay me down, I'm not my own I belong to Lay me down, lay me down Whoa, hand on my heart, this much is true There's no life apart from you Lay me down, lay me down Whoa, lay me down, lay me down Battle through every heartbreak, through 
every circumstance. I believe that you are my fortress. Yes, you are my portion. You are my hiding place. I believe in you.
So pull me a little closer. Take me a little deeper. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. Because your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. I want to know. is just to pull me closer to him to just draw because there's just so much to distract us in this world amen and so just to continue to just keep our eyes fixed on him and just say okay lord i need you to help put on my spiritual blinders because i can get distracted by all this negative stuff that's going on and so i just feel like you know it's kind of like the closer we are to him the less distracted we are it's like sitting up front when you're in school so you can't like I didn't do this in college, but if you sit in the back, that's where all the cute baseball players were. So if you sit in front, that's the same kind of concept, but just in a spiritual way. So welcome. I just want to say, I just confessed to y'all. Now y'all know the truth. But I want to say good morning, and we're glad to have you guys here. For all of you guys that are here this morning in person, hello. For those of you joining us online, we're thrilled to have you, and we welcome you to Woodbine Church as well. Um, tell your friends. We'd love to have them join us online as well. Um, we do have some announcements today, so if I can turn your attention to the screens.
Hey, Natalie had a rough week, I'm just saying. So, um, I want to share with you, uh, some of you are, might be thinking, wow, that spectacular basketball thing, uh, why haven't we heard about that before? Well, this was an opportunity that just came to us this week. So, uh, we were able to put it together, and uh, we want to thank those who brought it to our attention. And so, we hope you'll be able to be here. It'll be a lot of fun, and we hope you'll be able to join us uh, for that. We have a um, few uh, prayer requests, several prayer requests that we want to make sure you are aware of. Um, Seth McClure fell and broke, uh, well, was playing football, flag football, and was tackled during flag football and broke a collarbone there. So be in prayer for Seth. Thankfully, he doesn't have to have surgery to repair that. Uh, David Schultz is facing surgery in about just over a month, so be in prayer for David. Sally O'Bannon is facing surgery tomorrow, so be in prayer for Sally as she's praying and preparing for surgery for tomorrow. Uh, we uh, have a couple of folks that are really uh, in pretty bad shape, so we want to invite you to pray for them. I was introduced to Doug Meyer this past week. Uh, Doug has been battling cancer several times, but it, it has come back and it's uh, spread, so uh, he's really facing some very difficult times. So be in prayer for a new friend, Doug Meyer. Jacob uh, Van Tonder is, uh, started radiation treatment. Uh, he's already went through chemo twice. He's going through radiation, started this past Wednesday, so be in prayer for Jacob. Uh, we want to invite you to pray for Ann and Chuck Timms and their family. Ann, uh, her brother passed away um, this past week. The funeral was this past week, also over in Georgia. But while they were in line to go to the funeral, uh, to the procession there, to go to the graveside, they received uh, word that Chuck's mother uh, had a, a stroke. And so, Chuck is over in Mississippi right now uh, checking on his 88-year-old mom who had a stroke. So be in prayer for them and lift them up. Uh, if you have a prayer request for us, we would love for you to let us know about that. If you want to drop a note in the basket, offering basket, we'll get that for sure. But uh, you can find these uh, QR codes. You can scan those codes. And you can find a place on there where you can click. It'll let us know how we can pray for you with a, uh, uh, a prayer request. It comes straight to us. And we pray for you as we meet together tomorrow. Also, if you want to check in, if you want to get to a copy of the sermon notes and check that out, or if you would like to give online, you're welcome to do it in that way. And uh, that's another way you can uh, continue to support the ministry of the church. If you did bring an offering with you today, there are baskets out in the atrium. You can drop your offering in there as you leave in a little bit. Or again, you can give online. Um, I want to invite you, if you would like to, to join me here around the altar for a time of prayer. Will you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful that we can pause for right now, for this moment, and we can spend some time in prayer for these who are in such great need. Lord, we know this is not an exhaustive list. There are many others who stand in need of our prayers. And Father, I may have gotten some requests this past week and I may have forgotten to place them on this list. But we prayed for them this week. We've lifted them up. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, for your hand to be upon each and every one that's on this list. And also those that are in our hearts that, uh, Lord, they may be unspoken requests, but they stand in need of our prayers. Father, they, they, they're... There are needs in our hearts that are known between just you and us. And so, Father, as we call out those needs to you, we pray, Father, that we know that you'll hear them, that we pray that you would help us as we struggle. Help us with whatever request that we have. Help us to know your will. Lord, we know that the answer to our request is not always the way we want it, but we need to trust you that it's always going to be the way we need it, even when we don't understand it. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you know so much better than we do, and you're so much wiser than we are. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can always, always depend on you to do what's best. So, Father, we pray that we would just 
always learn to trust you more. We thank you that you have not only given us this day, but given us this opportunity to serve you, but also you've given us this place, this community to serve in. So be with us, Father, as we continue to find ways to reach out and serve you and serve these people in this community. We thank you, Father, that you're the first and the greatest giver. We thank you that all that we have comes from you. And today, we pause and give you thanks. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in the service. All the money that the world could hold Mountains made of solid gold Riches that could buy my dream You are better than all these things The prettiest face to turn their eyes Beauty that could hypnotize that looks may bring you are better than all these things your love is better than life you are the well that won't run dry I have tasted I have seen you are better than all these things power that could shake the moon most important one in every room Status matched by only kings You are better than all these things Your love is better than life You are the well that won't run dry I have tasted, I have seen You are better than Lord, your love is better than life. You are the well that won't run dry. I have tasted and I have seen. You are better than all these things. Being liked and loved by everyone. Approval that outshines the sun. Cheered by all who think of me You are better than all these things Being liked and loved by everyone Approval that outshines the sun Being cheered by all who think of me You are better than all these things and your love is better than life You are the well that won't run dry I have tasted and I have seen Oh, you are better than all these things And your love is better than life You are the well that won't run dry And I have tasted and I have seen you are better than all these things Lord you are better than all these things Heavenly Father we just thank you so much for a love the love that you give to us Father that is better than anything else that we can imagine Father there again there are so many things in this world to distract us so many things that the world deems are great and are desirable that should give us according to the world's status or position or show that we're successful. But Father, there is nothing that this world can offer that is greater than you. There is nothing, Lord, like being just completely covered in your love. So Father, we just thank you so much for giving that gift so freely. Let us just never forget 
once again, just draw us closer and keep our eyes on you, that we're not distracted by the scary things in the world or by the, the, the glittery and shiny things that this world tries to offer us because you, Father, are the way, the truth, and the life. So, Lord, we thank you so much for these reminders through song that we've been able to come together and lift up your, your praise as a body. And for those that are online, that hopefully, Father, that they too have been able to just praise you in this time. And now, Father, we ask for your anointing to be on our pastor as he brings your word. I ask, Lord, that every person that hears this, Father, will just, will just let it just bury deeply into their hearts, Father, and that we will be nourished and changed and more bold than ever because this is a world that needs to know you, Lord. So we give you glory for everything in your son's precious name. Well, we are only have a couple more sermons left in this series. We've talked about how God does not know about anything more deadly than sin. God does not know of a better place to spend eternity than heaven. God does not know of a worse place to spend eternity than hell. Uh, you know, we've talked about the, how that God does not know how to save someone except through Jesus. And so we are also today going to start out with number five. God does not know how to save an unbeliever. Uh, I've been in my research, I read in a lot of different areas. I really appreciate uh, some of the stuff I read from Craig Rochelle and some of the material I've read from him. It's just really good stuff when it talks about an unbeliever. Um, so, you know, today we're going to deal with this very, very important question that I firmly believe hits one of the most important topics in, the, uh, in, in faith communities. No matter what, where the church is, it hits... These very, in all these faith communities. And yet, to be honest, it's probably one of the least talked about subjects. So today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about spiritual doubts. When Jesus asked the question, why do doubts rise in your mind? I want us to think about that. Well, you know, why do doubts come up in us? Is there something wrong with us when we start to doubt? Is there something wrong with us when we struggle with faith, with issues and matters of faith? Uh, you know, what happens to us when we go through these times of doubt? Now, some of you may be sitting out there saying, well, Jimmy, I never deal with that problem. Well, I'm probably not talking to you today, so just hang out. You can give this information to somebody else, okay? <laughs> Uh, if you never deal with doubts, that's great. For some, you know, they say the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. And that's great if that's who you are. Uh, I'm very excited for you and I'm very proud for you. But for other people, it's not quite that simple. You see, there are certain things I want us to understand today. And the first thing is this, is doubting is real. You know, some people say things like, uh, I really want to believe, but I'm naturally skeptical. Or some may say, well, I'm analytical and I want to believe, but I need to have some questions answered before I can believe. Others may say, well, I need to see some things before I can believe. I, I need proof. You know, some people have doubt that if, is all this Christianity stuff true? I, I, you, maybe if you've heard me tell the story. My friend Dan, he shows up at, outside the office. Never met Dan before in my life. He shows up at a church I was serving. We were getting ready to do a, a program called the Alpha Course, Alpha Program. And the Alpha Program was just trying to help people answer hard questions. We've done a little bit of that here, had that uh, here before, and, and Dan shows up. He had seen an announcement about it in one of the newspapers or something. He shows up, and these are his exact words to my secretary. I need to talk to somebody because I don't know if this Christianity stuff is true. Well, my secretary, being the sweet, godly woman she was, said, hold on, I'll get Jimmy. And then we began our discussion as he was dealing with his doubts. There are people out there who have that very real question, is Christianity true? Is it real? Why should I trust it? 
Now, speed along with Dan, after several months of questioning and dealing with his doubts and all of that, he came to faith in Christ and had the joy of baptizing him. But he, he walked into my office with doubt. And it wasn't me that was so smart that I talked him into anything. It's God revealed to him the truth. See, doubts can come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There there are those who doubt the existence of God. And even more than doubt, they they believe, they, they believe with all their hearts that there's no way that God can exist. And anybody, they believe that anybody who believes that God exists is just foolish. There are other people who will give God the benefit of the doubt. Well, you know, so, you know, yeah, you're probably, you know, there's probably some kind of higher power that's out there, but I really doubt he's involved in human life. There are others who say, well, I doubt God hears my prayers. I've prayed a lot and he didn't do anything. So obviously, he's either not paying attention or he doesn't have the ability. Usually we pray, we, people say that because God hadn't answered the prayer the way they want him to answer the prayer. I mean, if we're being real. Some people would doubt that God would actually love them. If there is a God, after all I've done, God couldn't possibly love me. Or knowing the ways that I have sinned and hurt other people... If there is a God, God could not possibly forgive me. Some people even believe that if you have spiritual doubts, that means you don't have any faith. And if you have doubts, you probably are not really saved. And if you have any doubts, then you're really not following Jesus. Now I want to go ahead and tell you that that last statement is not true. See, don't miss this. Unless you actually push through some honest doubts, you may never experience the depth of faith that you could. See, when we doubt, it should lead us to do more uh, uh, seeking God. It should lead us to do more looking into what our doubt is saying. And then it can help solidify our faith even more. See, some people say that doubt is the end of real faith. I'm going to argue that for a lot of people, doubt is not the end of real faith. Doubt is the beginning of the search to find real, sincere, and grounded faith. You need to hear this. While doubting is real, your doubts do not disqualify you from following Jesus. They do not disqualify you from coming to Jesus. I want us to look at a guy in the scriptures, a guy that was branded a doubter. In the Bible, he's known as, see if you can guess, Doubting Thomas. Y'all have heard of him. Wow. You know how many verses there are in the Bible that tell us about Thomas? Thomas. 12. There are 12 verses in the Bible that tell us, uh, that talk about Thomas. And in those verses, he's branded throughout history as doubting Thomas. Listen, I want you to follow this. That what we're going to see about Thomas's life shows us That who he becomes is evidence that even the biggest doubters can one day have the strongest faith. See, Jesus had risen from the dead. And after he had risen from the dead, there's these two guys. They were walking and they were going to the community of Emmaus. As they were walking to Emmaus... Jesus walks up on them and then starts walking with them. And as he's walking with them, he begins to have a conversation about them, uh, with them. And, and, you know, he's wondering, why are y'all so glum? What's happening? You know, what happened? And they look at him, and this is kind of a paraphrase, and say, where have you been, man? (laughs) 
Hadn't you heard what happened? They crucified Jesus. And Jesus began to talk to them, and he, as he talked to them, he, he, uh, uh, you know, he went back to their house, and, he, and, and, and they were getting ready. These two believers, not the original, they were not a part of the original disciples. These were just two believers. And, and as they, they go back to their house, Jesus begins to share a meal with them, and then they realize, man, I'm talking to Jesus. And Jesus said, check me out. I got the holes to prove it. They're right here in my hands. I'm real. And I'm alive. And they leave there. And then they take off running. They go all the way back to Jerusalem to find the other 11 disciples. We pick up the story from the great historian Luke. Luke writes this in Luke 24. He says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. I mean, uh, listen, of course, of course they were frightened. Of course they were startled. They knew that he died on the cross. They knew that he had been buried in a tomb. They knew that dead people stayed dead. I mean, these folks saw him dead, all the way dead. I mean, really dead. He was not like in the prince's bride, you know, just a little bit dead. He was not just somewhat dead. He was not mostly dead. He was sure enough dead. I mean, they had seen that. And Jesus, you know, he said, why are you so troubled? Why? He said, did you forget about me opening the eyes of the blind? Did you forget about me restoring hearing to the deaf? Did you forget? Did you forget about me raising three people? You guys saw me raise three people from the dead. You saw that. Little girl, the widow of Nain's son, and Lazarus. You, you saw that. I promised you. I pr fellas, listen, I promised you I was coming back. I told you that. He said, I'm gonna, you, I said, I'm gonna die. Three days later, I'm back. I told you that was going to happen. That was the plan. I told you. And then he says, hey, come here. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Touch me. Does a, is a ghost have flesh and blood? Look at the holes in my hands. Look at the holes in my feet. Look where the nails went through. Come and touch me and see for yourself. Oh, they doubted with him standing right there. Wouldn't you? How many of you have seen some dead come back to life? Hadn't happened again. He was the last one. These, these two believers, they, they were not a part of the original disciples. They realized that Jesus was alive. They ran to Jerusalem. They found the 11, 11 remaining disciples and they told them that Jesus was alive. And, and while they were there, Jesus appeared to them. And, and all of that went on just like we just read in Luke. And then guess who was not at that meeting? Oh, Thomas. Thomas was not there. How do we know Thomas was not there? John, who was there, tells us Thomas wasn't there. Notice this. Pick it up in John 20. He says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus... One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Have you ever got up on a Sunday and you didn't want to go to church? Don't raise your hand. I 
I mean, you can if you want to, because I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I've gotten up on a Sunday and not wanting to go to church. And I'm the preacher. Can, can I be real with you? I got up this morning, not, this morning not wanting to go to church. Dealt with some stuff this week. Went through some stuff this week. And this morning, I got up not wanting to come. I mean, I'm just telling you the honest to goodness truth. Now, some people, I know you might find it strange, a preacher not wanting to go to church. Hmm. What kind of preacher have we got? There are some people who think I live here. I mean, I love seeing the little kids. I, I, I go out, you know, I come in here and do chapel with them on Wednesday mornings, and then they see me somewhere else, and it's like, what are you doing in Walmart? Why are you at Publix? Why in the world are you at Lowe's? I mean, you live at the church. And it's amazing. They, they see me. Then I see some other folks. They go, I know you from somewhere. Where do I know you? You're a preacher. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm known that way, and I get all of that. And I know that they're, especially the little ones, they think I live here and I never, ever leave. Somebody brings in food, I guess. And I, don't, I don't know how they think that happens, but that's what they think, and I get that. But there are some days I get up and I just don't want to go. And contrary to what you think, I don't show up on Sunday because I'm a preacher. I was showing up on Sunday before I became a preacher. The reason I tell you all that is Thomas missed church. Jesus showed up, and Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am with them. That's church. He, he's there. And Thomas missed church. And while there's some days I don't, I don't feel like showing up, some days I don't want to get up and go, and, you know, but I still get up and go. And the reason I get up and go is because I know, I know that on those days, God's got something planned and I don't want to miss it. And he's not got something planned because I studied and put a sermon together and I got to have somebody to talk to. He's not, that's not how he works. Listen, God shows up. And I don't want to miss him showing up. Peter, I mean, excuse me, Thomas missed it. What did he miss? He missed the presence of Jesus. He, he missed the power of Jesus. He missed the proof of Jesus. He, he missed the Jesus saying, peace, be still. Guys, it's okay. I'm here now. See, you miss a lot. When you miss church. See the other disciples told Thomas. And that Jesus had been there. You know what Thomas said? Mm -mm. No he wasn't. John tells us what he said. He says unless I see. Thomas is talking. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands. And put my finger where the nails were. And put my hand into his side. I will not believe. Thomas wanted proof. He wanted proof. And, and see, there's a big problem today, at least in American churches. So many, so many people just kind of believe because their parents believed. So many people just kind of believe because other people have believed. They have not truly believed in Jesus for themselves. They believe about Jesus and they know about Jesus, but they have not believed Jesus. Listen, God does not know how to save someone who will not believe. So listen, I'll, don't miss the claims 
of the disciples. That's the other thing I want you to catch. Don't miss the claims of the disciples. They claimed that God loved us so much that he did not stay in heaven, but he became one of us in the person of his son, Jesus, who was born of a virgin. Therefore, he did not inherit the sin nature of a human being, but the divine nature of his heavenly father. Therefore, he could not he that he could live without sin and then on the cross because he lived without sin and was a perfect sacrifice he could take our sin on him and then he could die for us they believe that they claim that these eyewitnesses claim that Jesus didn't stay dead and that on the third day the stone was rolled away and he was not in there they claim that he was risen from the dead and listen if that is true and I firmly believe it is if that is true the fact that Jesus did all of that for you it demands a response And to me, the only reasonable response for a Savior who died for me is for me to live for Him. What Thomas was saying, listen, this is important to me. And I know that if this is true, I want to know it. And because if it is true, it changes everything. See, some people say you can't find faith if you doubt. But sometimes you can't have real faith unless you press through those sincere doubts and get to the other side. You need to hear this. The fourth thing is this. Doubts are not the end of real faith. For so many people, doubt is the beginning of a solidified, rock-solid faith that will carry them on to glorify God in everything that they do. Their doubt leads them to the truth, and the truth changes their life. Just like my friend Dan. He came in doubting. I, I, he said, I don't know if this Christianity stuff is true. You know what I never did? I never took out the Bible and hit him with it. I mean, I have a pretty heavy Bible. I could have made an impression on him. I never did that. Never even opened it up. I just let him ask questions and ask questions and ask questions. And the more he asked, the more I saw his doubt, and the more I saw God moving him to true faith. He said, I want to read something. I said, well, I got some things you can read. He said, I'm going to start reading the Bible. I didn't tell him that. After a few meetings with him, we met every week, usually four or five hours a time. And, you know, he was retired and I was a preacher. We could hang out together. I mean, you know, that's just how it was. And I talked with him. He said, I want to start reading the Bible. I said, well, great. Start in John. Don't start in Genesis. Don't start in Matthew. Start in John. He said, okay, why? And I said, because the reason to start in John is John 20, 31 says, That these things, talking about everything John wrote, are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and in believing you might have life. That's why you start in John. So everything John writes about there, the parables Jesus tells, the miracles Jesus does, the teachings that Jesus has, all of the sayings that Jesus has that are included in John are to point you to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. So just hang out with that for a little while. And he did. His doubts led him to real faith. And buddy, once he got a hold of it, I mean, he was in his mid-60s. He, he was retired, retired from, uh, I think, International Paper up there in Prattville. He, he retired from there. And he, he had all this time on his hands. And buddy, he, he just got on fire. His doubts led him to a real faith. Thomas said, I, I want to believe, but I need a little bit more. See, there are some of you either here in this room or some of you watching online. You want to believe, but you need just a little bit more. That's exactly what Jesus did for Thomas. Check this out. 
John, again, records what happened. A week after Jesus appeared to the other 11, check this out. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. That's a key part of this verse. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Listen, if a, st- if a huge stone won't keep him in a tomb, a locked door won't keep him out of the room. He showed up. He showed up. Then he said to Thomas, he looked directly at Thomas. He said to Thomas, he said, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand out and put it into my side. That's where the spear went in that the Roman soldier stuck him through the heart to make sure he was dead. And he said, stop doubting and believe. Did you notice that Jesus didn't talk to any other disciples there? In that moment, they were all there. Jesus had spoken to them a week earlier. Now, Jesus cares. Listen, Jesus cares about the one who wants to believe. He cares about all of us, but he really cares about the one who wants to believe. And he was speaking directly to Thomas. Did you notice what Jesus didn't say? Jesus didn't say, Thomas, I don't know why you're here. You have doubts. Get out. If you're going to doubt me, there's the door. I'll unlock it for you. Go on. He never says that. What Jesus does say, Thomas, Touch the hole where the nail went through. Oh, and Thomas, right here. Put your hand in the hole where the spear went in. See, he focused this part of his time with the disciples on the one who had the doubts. You know, if we're true, if we're going to be real... You could have a doubting Matthew and a doubting Luke. and a, uh, You could have a doubting John. You can have a doubting Bartholomew and a doubting An- Andrew and a doubting Peter. You know why? Because they a week later, they were up in, up in the room. They, they, were, they were locked up. They didn't believe that Jesus was alive, and he appears to them. So don't just don't push it all off on Thomas. You know, they had their doubts too. But Jesus spoke to their doubts. He said, touch me and stop doubting and believe. And that's what I want you to get from this. And Jesus gave Thomas exactly what he needed to believe. See, I believe that today somehow that for some of you, the presence of God is going to give you what you need to believe. Whether you're in this room or you're online... God's going to give you what you need to believe. See, just like Jesus did for doubting Thomas, he's got a gift for you. Paul said it the best. In the letter to the church in Ephesus, he wrote this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves... It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It is a gift that God wants to give you if you'll believe. See, we can't be made right with God based on our performance. We can't be made right with God based on our works. We can't be made right with God in any other way except by His grace through faith and by believing in Him. You know what Jesus said to Thomas After he touched him. I mean after he appeared to Thomas. He said this. Blessed are you Thomas because you have seen me and believed. Then he said this. Catch this. Because he's talking to you. Blessed are those who have not seen. And yet believe. That's us. I haven't. Jesus hasn't come to me and said hey Jimmy. I know you got some doubts. Put your finger right here in my, my, the hole in my hand. And touch, touch what happened you know, where the spear went in my side. Look at what happened to my feet. Look at the scars on my head from where the nails, I mean, where the thorns were pressed in. He hasn't done that. 
But what he's given to me is he's given to me over and over and over and over and over again reasons to believe in him. And the greatest reason I can think of that I can give to you is because Jesus said, I love you and I died for you. And if you would have been the only person ever to, to have been born lost, Jesus would have still died on the cross for you. When you realize how much God loves you and how his grace is intended for you, and you allow him to work in your life and help you with your doubts, you will see that he can help bring you truly to believe in him. That's what Jesus did. He said, touch me, Thomas. Touch me. You know what Thomas did? It's not recorded that Thomas touched Jesus. I don't think he needed to. You know what it is recorded that Thomas said? John, who was there, he was an eyewitness. He wrote this about Thomas. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. I mean, I can, uh, in my mind, I can see what's happening. Jesus appears and he's not rebuking Thomas. He is encouraging Thomas. He said, man, I'm here for you. Come here and touch it. Touch it. Touch me. I'm real. I'm here, Thomas. I'm here. And I can, you know, I can see Thomas. I mean, looking at Jesus in my mind, I can see him doing that. And I don't think that he had to rush over to Jesus. I think all he had to do was go down and say, my Lord and my God, my doubts are gone. My doubts are no more. You're here before me. I don't have to touch you. My doubt is, has vanished. All he could say is, my Lord and my God. For Thomas, it became intensely personal. You notice what he didn't say? He didn't say, our Lord and our God. You catch that? My Lord. My God. It was personal. He wasn't just believing in Jesus. He was believing Jesus. Listen, there's a difference between believing in Jesus and believing Jesus. The demons believe in Jesus, but there's no way they can be saved. The scripture says they believe in him and they shudder. They, they, you know, they, 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 they are so afraid that they believe in him. They believe he exists. They believe he died to save Jesus, save people's souls. They believe all of that. They believe in him, but they don't believe Jesus. My question is, do you believe Jesus? Do you believe that he loves you? Do you believe that he died for you? Do you believe he wants to save you? Do you believe Jesus? Thomas. What happened to him, it became personal. He believed Jesus and it became personal. That happened to Thomas. That's what happened to me. And I'm just crazy enough to believe it can happen to you. You want to build your faith? You have your doubts? I get that. I still struggle with some doubts now. If I told you anything else, I'd be lying to you. That's just the honest to goodness truth. I can't answer your, all the questions. I can't tell you why my dad died on my 21st birthday or why my mom died on my 49th birthday. I can't tell you why that happened. And trust me, I've talked to God about it. I've had my doubts. And I get questions that come up to me and, and I, I, I can't figure them out. And I can't answer them for somebody else. And I'm wondering, okay, is there something wrong with me? I start doubting me. And then I'm doubt. well, God, are, are, what, what's happening? Why can't I get that answer? And when I start doubting, and maybe when you start doubting, you need to go back to those who were eyewitnesses to Jesus. If you want to build your faith, check out their stories and who they were. Peter told Jesus in the garden, <laughs> these other jokers will run away, but I'm not. 
I'm all these other guys, they will. I'm your man, Jesus. Jesus looked at him and he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the morning. Guess what? Peter ran away with all the others. And he denied Jesus. And then after the resurrection, Jesus appears to Peter and he looks at him. He says, hey, hey Pete, come here. You love me? <laughs> you know, I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Jesus forgave Peter for denying him. And then, you know, that, that happens and Jesus forgives him. And Peter is so transformed by Jesus that he preaches on the day of Pentecost, the day that you can read about in Acts. You read about Peter going up into, he's in the upper room and, and, and the Holy Spirit descends on them and he fills up the people and fills up the room. And then Peter goes out and he preaches and 3,000 people come to faith right then. One of the greatest sermons ever preached. He becomes a rock. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to be a rock. That's why he was named Peter. It means rock. You're going to be a rock. He said, he said you're going to do that. And, and, and listen, you're going to, to be the rock that you're going to need to be. And he became that. And he, he began to preach. And then one day people came to him and they, they, you know, they came to Peter and said, listen, unless you deny Jesus, we're going to take your life. He had already denied him three times. He had practice. And Peter said, uh-uh. I will never deny Jesus ever again. Never. He said, we're, we're going to crucify you like we did Jesus. Tradition says that Peter said, oh no, you can't do it like Jesus. I'm not worthy to even die like Jesus died. Crucify me upside down. That same Jesus that Peter denied is the same Jesus that Peter was willing to die for. I want to ask you, what would your brother have to do to convince you that he is the Messiah? Those of you who have brothers, what would they have to do? If you had a brother, what would he have to do to convince you that he's the Messiah? Jesus had brothers. He had one brother by the name of James. He was the half-brother of Jesus. He, he became a leader in the church. And when the enemies of Christ came to James, they said, Renounce your faith in your brother or we'll kill you. James said, I will not. My brother is my savior. So they pushed him off the temple. He fell many feet, but he didn't die. And whenever he didn't die, when he hit the ground, they took a club and they beat him to death. And as they were beating him to death, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Paul, who hated Christians so much that he killed them, then in a vision he meets the risen Christ and he's transformed so that he's so transformed that those he hated, he becomes the leader of. And he said these words, he wrote them down for us to hear. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And they put that to the test. Paul, you're going to shut up preaching? No. You're going to deny Jesus? No. Off with his head. They killed him. Thomas, an unfairly branded doubter. He became a person of great faith. Once Thomas got what he needed, he traveled farther than any other disciple. It, it, we have it that Thomas went all the way to India preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
all the way over into India. And because he believed so much, the reason he did it, he believed so much that they needed a relationship with the Christ that had transformed him. And one day he was told to renounce his faith. And this man who had doubted before said, there is no way. And so they drove a spear through his body. Listen, hear this. The Jesus that Thomas doubted was the Jesus that Thomas was willing to die for. These Christ followers believed in Jesus enough to die for him. I want to ask you, do you believe in Jesus enough to live for him? I've told y'all many times that my faith is not perfect. I've told y'all that I have doubts just like anybody else. I, you know, but when I focus more on God, He helps me through my doubts to a faith that believes that the tomb is empty and He is risen. Some of you listening right now, either here in this room or online, you're listening and you're struggling with, your, with some doubts. And I want to remind you that doubt is not the end of real faith. For a lot of people, it's the beginning of real faith. I I believe that at this moment, that there are some of you, there there are those of you who because of the presence of God, you're going to stop doubting and you're going to start believing. Not because I've convinced you of anything, but because of what Christ has done. He's the one who's convinced you. There are some you've doubted that is God real? Is Jesus really the only way? Could God really love me? Could he forgive me even if he exists? And right now something is happening in your heart and in your life that's drawing you even closer to God. And it's a supernatural power and presence of God. And he loves you. And there's nothing that you can do to make him love you any more. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you any less. Love is not what he does. Love is who he is. And I believe with all my heart that he loved you so much that he became a man in the person of his son Jesus who was without sin, he died and he rose again. And because eyewitnesses believed it enough to die for him, even non-Christian historians will record how these eyewitnesses died for Jesus. That's how we know how it happened. And because of the work of Christ in believers all over the world, and because of my firsthand knowledge of His grace, I believe He, I know He changed me, and I believe that He can change you. See, it's time, as Jesus said to Thomas, it's time to stop doubting and start believing. Believe He can change you. Believe He can forgive you. Believe that He is Lord. Surrender your life to Him completely. And just trust Him even in the midst of your doubt. You may be there and you say, well, I don't know everything. Well, y'all have heard me preach. I don't know everything either. I've told you that. You don't need... To know everything, to believe something. I promise you, you do not know everything there is about electricity. But you sure are thankful that it's running the air conditioner. Doesn't stop you from using it. If you wait till you know everything about everything, you'll never use anything. You'll definitely never get married. And if you do get married, you'll never have kids. See, not knowing, listen, do you know, whenever you had your, your first child, you know what happened? You walked in to the hospital, your wife gave birth, three days later, they send you home with no instructions. Didn't keep you from raising them. Listen. You don't have to know everything to believe something. So I want to invite you to start. 
start believing this. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God who can forgive me and make me new. And today, by faith, I trust him and I give my life to him. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. And that changes everything. God does not know how to save someone who won't believe in Jesus. The question is, will you believe today? And if you already know him and you already believe in him, my question for you is this. Who are you praying for that doesn't? Will you pray with me? Our Father and our God, we come before you right now with thanksgiving. Thanking you for the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope that is ours because of you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you save us. Father, right now, there may be some that want to begin that relationship with you. They want to move past their doubts and enter into faith. Is that who you are? Do you want to move past your doubt and believe in something right now? Even with all the questions that you have that aren't answered, just believe in one thing. And that is that Jesus died for you and he rose again so that you might have eternal life and he'll forgive you of your sins. Wherever you are, if you want to do that, if you're in this room or you're watching online... I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart. You can do it with this very simple prayer. It's the beginning of a relationship with him, and it's a step of faith. So just pray after me in your own words. You can remember it with these four words. The first part of this prayer is sorry. God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry that I've rejected you up to this point. The next word is please. Please come into my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Please save me. Please become my Lord and my God. The last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for never giving up on me. Thank you for helping me with my doubts. Father, for those who have prayed that prayer for the first time today in minute, I pray that you would work in their life in a very powerful, powerful way. I pray that they would lean more on you and uh, less on themselves. I pray, Heavenly Father, that when they deal with doubts, they would come to you with those doubts. I pray that they would lean more on you, even when they doubt. I pray that for all of us, those of us who have already been Christ followers for a while. I pray that we would lean more on you than we do on ourselves. I pray, God, that it, as we deal with the doubts in our lives and in, in our minds, I pray that you would help us. Help us, Lord, to trust you more. Reveal yourself to us and your will for our lives in a way that is un questionably you help us in our doubt to move to deeper faith in your name I pray amen how's God dealing with you in your life right now what do you need to deal with what are you struggling with what doubts come up in your mind whatever it is God is bigger than your biggest doubt if you would like to spend some time in prayer here at these altars, we'd, I'd love for you to do that. If you want me to pray with you, I welcome that opportunity. If you feel comfortable enough with me praying with you, I promise you I feel way more comfortable praying with you. Just get my attention, and if you get my attention, I'll pray with you. Do you need to follow Jesus? Do you need to pray for someone who needs to follow Jesus? Are you willing to surrender to Him? Whatever it is, this altar is open for you to come as we stand to sing. All to Jesus I surrender All to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence
presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken take me Jesus take me now and I surrender I like that song because it says I surrender all. It doesn't say I surrender some or I surrender a part or I surrender a little bit. It says I surrender all. I hope you've done that. I hope you're following Jesus. I hope you're moving through your doubts to real faith. If you need help with that, if you would like for us to help you with it or if you've made a decision for Jesus, you can email us and it comes straight to me. It's I am in at woodbinechurch.org. I A M I N. I am in at woodbinechurch.org and we will be glad to help you out and help you with your next walk, next steps in your faith journey. Um, thank you so much for being here. If you're a first timer here, if you've been here before and I had not met you, I'll be in the library. I'd love to visit with you as you exit the doors. Hang left. If you feel comfortable visiting with me, I sure feel comfortable visiting with you. So drop in and see me. And as Miss Brenda is coming up, she's going to close us out. But I do want to remind you that... Uh, if you could, anybody that can help out, John's going to be here, and he is going to, he's showing me something too. Okay, yeah, the brown bags, yeah, the, the menus for the brown bags, don't forget to pick that up. Thank you, John. But he'll also be here uh, showing, uh, you know, showing you how to help out to get ready for the next service. We appreciate it. Ms. Brenda? Thank you, Pastor. I want to divide up Ron. He's our SPR chair. He has a little announcement he'd like to make. Thanks, Brenda. SPR is uh, Staff Paris Relations. Um, we do have this one month in the in the in the year to show our appreciation for Pastor and Anita, and we do want to love on them uh, this month. And next month, next week, next Sunday is the time we'll have the cake that he loves. He's got to share because we're giving it to him. So. Make sure and uh, make sure and love on them. Give them gifts and their cards and letters and uh, and and money online if you want to. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we just thank you that Jesus came and died so the Holy Spirit can live in each and every one of us. Lord, let us get a hold of that favor that we have. Let us understand that you are within us and you're leading and guiding us every day. Lord, be with your people. They're the body of Christ. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Give them hope. Give them whatever they need in order to know Jesus is real and wants to make a difference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week. And I surrender all. Oh.